Hi, my name is John Steele and I've been asked to give you some advice as, as planners setting out in the business. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person, but, but hopefully uh, this advice will be at least somewhat helpful. Um, I think the, the first thing I'd have to say to any planner um, at whatever level is that it's your job to be useful. And a lot of planners get carried away with the idea of, of being clever. Um, being cleverer than the other people around them, showing off their formidable intellect and you know, debating issues, uh, researching issues to their finest, finest points. And, and that's fine. I love having clever planners around me, uh, but cleverness is simply a means to an end. And, and what I'm looking for in any planner who works with me um, is the ability to solve problems, and the ability to suggest simple solutions to those problems. It's really as simple as that. Um, it's also their job to bring out the best in other people. Um, a lot of debates I've heard around agencies over the years have to do with who had the idea. And as a planner, I think you have to be very comfortable with other people having the ideas and with your role as a catalyst for those ideas. Um, to me, the planners who've claimed ownership of ideas have generally been the less successful ones in an agency because because people resent them and, and become jealous of them. And the greatest pleasure I've ever derived in my planning work has been where I've, I've had an idea, I've, I've laid out a lot of pieces of information that together add up to that idea, um, but in laying them out to the right person, I've had them say, hey, I've got this idea, what do you think? Um, it's the direction I wanted them to go in. Um, but, but because they've had the idea themselves, they feel ownership for it. Uh, and that's, that's the way it should be. Often I've heard planners in the agency praised because they've got a fearsome intellect, um, they've got fantastic research capabilities, their analytical abilities are second to none, they're excellent in written and verbal presentation, and all of those things are great. If any of you watching this have all of those abilities and can put them together, then you know I'd want to give you a job. But in the end, um, like cleverness, those things are simply means to an end. Planners have to be good to varying degrees across that whole range of abilities, but it has to take second place to the quality and effectiveness of the work that's being produced on the business that they're working on. If the work isn't great, then they're not doing their job properly. And when I ran a planning department for the last time, uh, that, that was the way I reviewed people. I, I wasn't interested in reading their creative briefs or seeing their debrief documents as, as fine as those might have been. Um, all I was interested in was, was whether we were doing the most distinctive and relevant work that we could on the business that we were working on. And over the years I've had planners who are probably not as good as others in the department at many of those things. You know, they're maybe not the best researchers, they're maybe not the best with numbers, the most analytical, perhaps they're not the best presenters or the best writers. But they, but they work, um, they're, they're useful, that when they knock on a creative person's door or an account person's door or a client's door, that person's pleased to see them um, because they know that they're going to help in some way. And, and those are the planners who over the years I've valued the most, um, the ones who do bring out the best ideas in others, um, the ones who others are most comfortable coming up with stupid things in front of because they feel completely comfortable and that's an essential part of the creative development process. Um, but first and foremost piece of advice, be useful. Um, don't be clever, be useful. That raises another question, how do you be use most useful as a planner? And I've always thought of the planner's job being to make connections. Uh, you've got a brand promise uh, and you have to connect that to a broader cultural truth and a deeper human truth. Um, uh, so, uh, so you have to understand the context in which that brand exists from a cultural, economic, social point of view. Uh, but you also have to understand deeper human instincts and deeper human motivations. And, and if you can make a brand promise work in the context of those things, I believe you can't go far wrong. But if you're going to do it as a planner, it's essential that you experience real life, uh, that you spend a decent amount of every day out there in the real world riding buses in stores in bars in car dealerships wherever seems relevant 
um, in terms of the kind of places where people are thinking about and using the brands that, that you, and, and, and relating to the brands that you're working on. And uh, you've got to get out of the office to do that. Uh, there's a whole new generation of planners who I regard as Google planners. They just sit in front of their computer, type in keywords and think that that constitutes research. Uh, and certainly that can be helpful for some parts of the research that you need to do. Um, it can be useful in looking at competitive activity. It can be useful in understanding a category. But in my view, there's no substitute for being out there in the real world, interacting with the people uh, who you're trying to understand and influence. There's another reason for suggesting that planners spend a lot of time out in the real world too, which is that I think if they do that, they're much more effective um, in terms of a, a productivity, um, in terms of their productivity. Uh, it's where when I was last running a planning department in the United States, I used to give all of my planners unlimited vacation. Uh, there were two conditions. Uh, one, that they used that vacation, and two, that they didn't abuse the offer. And I suppose over the years I was there, most of the planners took about four weeks vacation a year, which in the United States, where the norm is one or two weeks, that's quite a lot. But in that four weeks, they were able to take trips to the Amazon, um, to travel around the, the churches of Europe, to, to go take painting classes, to learn to be a sculptor, to do charity work, to visit Africa, take the longer trips, ones that allowed you to travel in the truest sense and, and, and be part of a culture rather than just passing through. Or think, I suppose in, in, in the end, it was, it was time that made my planners more interesting and more interested. And they're very valuable people to have in an agency. It also meant that they weren't tired all the time. And I would much rather have somebody working for me for 48 weeks a year than 52 weeks a year because I know I'm going to get better work out of them. So it's not a benevolent thing on my part saying take unlimited vacation. It's selfish. You know, I want them to be more productive and in the time that they're in the agency. But I also want them to have a broader frame of reference from which they can start to make the connections that I was talking about. Um, but, but the, the other advantage of getting out of the office, not just for, for vacations, but on a daily basis, and I used to tell my department too to put fictitious meetings in their calendar each day, uh, meetings that, for, you know, that they'd make up a name, they'd make up a purpose for the meeting, but I'd say, I just want you to go buy a cup of coffee and sit by San Francisco Bay for an hour and watch the world go by, or go ride on a bus, um, or go running, or go to the gym, or what, whatever you do that makes it more likely that you'll be able to switch your mind off and have good ideas. Uh, because when I ask people where they have their best ideas, where they have them is generally like in the shower, walking the dog, jogging, driving to work, shaving. Um, it, it's, it's any place other than sitting at their desk in front of their computer or while punching the buttons on their Blackberry. Um, and, and the reason people have their ideas in places like that is that's where their subconscious is most active and your subconscious is many, many times more powerful than the conscious part of your mind. So from, a, from the point of view of, of having ideas, being able to solve problems, coming up with interesting new ways of looking at old data, I think it's vital that, that at every point, that at some point in every day, planners learn to just drop a subject, go away, do something else, and in the end, um, the answer will come. So for all those reasons, I think it's very important for, for you to create a, a working method by which some of your day is spent in the office and in discussion with the other people whose opinions are important on your brand, but some of your day also has to be spent away from it, um, away from the category, away from the brand, um, away from the client, where you can look at things from a real person's perspective, but you're also opening up your mind to more interesting solutions. The last thing I wanted to say is that a lot of people say to me these days, oh, everything's changed, planning has to change because advertising has changed, nothing is the way that it used to be, everything is digital now, and if you propose anything other than digital solutions, then you're old fashioned and generally hopeless and you know you should drag your sorry old ass out of the business and go somewhere else. And you know maybe it's my survival instinct, I don't think so, um, but I believe that's completely wrong. Uh, because in the end, in an analog world or a digital world, 
The key to success is understanding the basics of human communication. Understanding that in order to most effectively influence a group of people, you don't target them. Um, rather, as Jeremy Bormore says, you engage them as willing accomplices. And it's the planner's job in the agency to engage members of the target audience as willing accomplices, both in the process of developing the advertising campaign and in its execution. And obviously digital media give us a lot more means by which to touch these people and, and create our relationships with them. Um, but the very best work has always been interactive. Um, it's always, in a way, represented two-way communication. And one of the finest, uh, finest ever advertising people, a guy called Howard Gossage, um, who had an agency in San Francisco in the 1950s and 1960s, used to say, that the very best advertising is like one end of a very interesting conversation and it was a conversation starter and it was a stimulus for a two-way dialogue between the brand and the person who ultimately they were trying to get to connect with it and, and I've always liked that as a way of describing what we do. Um, similarly many years ago Steven Spielberg was asked what he thought was the secret to success of his movies and he said I think it's because I make movies for the masses but I talk to them one at a time. And it's the planner's job not to think about audiences, um, but to think about individuals and how the greatest number of individuals can be addressed by a message and engaged by a message and participate and become willing accomplices in a message. Um, not you know, it's, it's men aged over 35 or it's women aged under 25. That's hopeless. And it's, it represents planners being derelict in their duty. So I hope, that, uh, I hope that is in some way useful. Um, it's a long and circuitous ramble, uh, but I suppose to summarize, I'd say in order to be a more successful planner, you have to be useful. Uh, you have to place the quality and effectiveness of your work above your own cleverness and your own ego. Um, you have to be the one in the agency who makes the connections between a brand and the culture and, and the human context in which that brand exists. And, and it is your job to be seen to be not working at certain times, because at the times when you're not working are the times when you'll probably produce your very best work. And in the end, remember that however complex things become, however interesting the technology uh, is, um, whatever exciting things that allows us to do, in the end we're still talking about basic human communications and how, how one person talks to another, how one alien talks to another alien. It's your job to find the, the common ground and the common language. Thank you very much for listening and good luck.